Welcome to our third lecture of the Planetary Health Academy. Um, the title of today's lecture is Health for Future, the Path to Living Healthy and Good Lives. After our first two sessions and in view of just some of the information available on our situation, the severity is clear. We know that our planet is in a bad state and that we have to make dramatic changes. Science is very clear about that. But how can we deal with it? Get depressed, be angry, get active, and how? We are in need of visions and directions we can pursue. And today we'll be seeking perspectives, giving guidance towards constructive changes. We have invited um, three guests who will talk about such perspectives. I'll briefly introduce them and then we'll start with some statements and a discussion. We invite you today, um, our participants, not just to ask questions as usually in the Q&A, but also to share with us your comments and your statements, um, which Sophie will read out and which will be part of the discussion later on. So now um, on our panel, we have um, Mayara Floss, who isn't there yet, but she'll be coming. Um, Mayara is a um, family doctor from Brazil and engaged in many projects in the field of um, rural health and of planetary health, both in educational as well as in, in practical contexts. And she's also worked for the Lancet Countdown Policy Brief for Brazil. Then second, welcome to Marilena Behrens, journalist and podcaster, or as she puts it, a possibilist. Um, with a background in philosophy and political sciences, she concentrates on paths of sustainable transformation and potentials or perspectives which can help um, for transformation. Then our third guest is Maike Weisflug. Welcome to you. Also a political scientist. Um, she's expert in the field of political theory, especially the work of the philosopher Hannah Arendt and of her theory of freedom and also of new beginnings. Maika concentrates on topics like the planetary boundaries or the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, finding new answers suggested by the philosophy of Hannah Arendt. Then our fourth panelist is Martin Herrmann, who you know very well from all the previous lectures. Um, he'll be both giving an input and moderating together with me today. So over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Hannah, and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, I'm very excited about Tuesday's sessions because we are living in very special weeks, what I experience. We have seen the, the judgment a few weeks ago from the German High Court on um, the necessity to have a climate law, which is really representing kind of uh, the needs also of the future generation. We have seen last week a judgment in uh, the Netherlands against Shell. Uh, there are many, many openings. On one side, we are seeing how urgent the situation is, but there's more commitment and understanding for transformative actions that I've ever seen before. So then what comes is the question, but how does it actually go? How do you develop transformational journeys? How do you develop kind of the critical path, the transformational path on a local level, global levels? Because one thing is clear, there will not be the one plan. Then it needs many, many initiatives on global scale where uh, small and large experiments are started, uh, where transformational journeys are defined for hospitals, for health institutions, for schools, for many, many other places. So then the question is what takes, uh, what is necessary to have this transformational journey and go from knowledge to transformative action. And on one side, you need to have a very clear and, and transparent and broad understanding of the current situation. What are the risks we need to take into account? What are the things that have been tried out that didn't work? What are possibilities and technologies and so, so on and so forth. But the other main dimension is that you need to have an idea where to go. What is the kind of life you want to live? How can a life look like if you have a different setting for cities, for countryside, for uh, certain professional settings, for universities, for schools? And that is connected with that we and many others need to be open to these spaces of possibility, to kind of an idea of what a good and healthy life looks like. 
um, to have it also the ability to judge when are we going more in the direction of where we want to go and where it's, is it going in the wrong direction. So this idea of having a very strong sense of motivation, of vision, of space of possibility is really critical for success. Uh, I might have mentioned in earlier sessions that I have been focusing on transformational change for the last 30 years. And I have seen if you have a, even a small number of people who have an idea of where we could go to, they can then kind of communicate the necessary changes. They can bring the examples so that others are seeing kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. Because if you don't see that light, it's very difficult to get active and kind of look beyond the limitations and beyond the hurdles that we have in front of us. So it's really a key and very critical thing. And oftentimes it's overlooked like. It's also important when you have an idea of this and you talk to a certain audience to then be able to tune into how can you communicate things so that these people in their extraordinary and, and unique setting can have an idea of the direction we are going to. So it's really a very, very important dimension. And uh, uh, we will also come back to it again in one of the later uh, lectures um, of, 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 our, of our lecture series. Now, unfortunately, Mayara hasn't shown up yet. I wrote her my, uh, a mail just a minute ago, but she hasn't answered. So that's why we are changing our flow and we are not starting with Mayana, we are starting with Marilena. Um, and the idea of today is that we have three uh, to four shorter statements, kind of inputs of five to 10 to 12 minutes. And then we'll go into discussion between us because it's also a very important thing that uh, you learn more about kind of the, the ideas of a healthy, good life in conversation, in bringing the ideas together. So we will also have quite a long part of discussing together. And then in the last half hour, we will take in your comments, more comments, not so much questions, your ideas. Uh, into our discussion and, and kind of enrich it with your ideas. So, um, Marilena, you're focusing at your work on fostering transformative literacy so that people understand what transformation actually can be about, to have a more complex understanding of what this is and how it is already kind of a key aspect of all of our lives. Um, so uh, what made you focus on enhancing the understanding of transformative change? What triggered you to kind of do the work that you're doing today? Well, thank you, first of all, that uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy and grateful to be here. It's a very interesting uh, group of people. I'm excited to get to know more about this topic, which is quite new for me since I'm not an expert in, in health and medicine. But you asked me about um, what made me focus on enhancing uh, understanding transformative change. First of all, I myself had the urge to broaden my own transformative literacy, by which I mean the ability to actively participate in the process of aligning the economy with planetary boundaries and human well being. Like I said, I'm not a scientist or expert. I think I'm just very curious and on the same hand, I'm very concerned about our well-being on Earth because as a lot of you probably know, the Club of Rome has already published The Limits of Growth 1972 and a lot of other studies have followed. So I don't think um, like Martin already mentioned that we, we lack knowledge, but there's a huge gap regarding the implementation of this knowledge. So we don't act as we should, as Greta always uh, insists. And I think we won't be able to close this gap only by spreading more information, which is, of course, necessary, but also by enhancing um, people's self-efficiency, um, by enabling people to understand and especially feel why this topic, um, planetary health, climate health, is important to all of us. Um, so my hope is that people will feel like they are able to make a difference, whether in politics, as teachers, as artists, or as parents. Because a lot in our world 
um, sometimes looks like it has, it has always been this way. Um, there's a interesting, quite known and a little bit funny sentence by the philosopher Frederick, Frederick Jameson. He once said, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. But this is, of course, not the case in, in many, in many um, areas of life. Just because we drive by cars doesn't mean that there is no alternative to this. In my opinion, we as humankind are such creative and impressive beings. But if we don't see and feel our own capacity to have a positive impact to transform our world towards a more sustainable, egalitarian and therefore healthy one, I think our creative potential is wasted. And it's like it's the society that also has to to create um, a ground like where plants grow people can grow also if a society is built in which people feel their own self-sufficiency and that they can um, participate yeah in a way you are also pointing to one of the three challenges we describe in planetary health one is a knowledge challenge then we have the implementation challenge and we have the imagination challenge and you were pointing to if i cannot imagine myself or yourself as someone who is making a potential critical difference uh, in going to a, to a kind of a healthy and good life that I would like to have, then I'm stuck. So, so this, this imagination, also changing the imagination about ourselves, about who we can be, is really critical. Now, um, in your work, you're also building on the work of Joseph Beuys, arguably one of the most uh, influential artists of the 20th century. You talk about Zukunftskunst, the art to create futures, to co-create social plastic. Boyce was always talking about everyone is an artist, but he didn't mean necessarily a painter or an actor. He meant that everyone, everyone has creative potential. So the, the uh, kind of connectedness with this creative potential of us is critical for transformative change. So perhaps you can explore a bit more and, and, and uh, kind of talk a bit about what is your deep connection with the artistic world and the relevance of being connected to our creativity. Well, I think you, you already put it very precisely in words um, that being an artist doesn't necessarily mean to, to paint or to dance or to be an actor or actress. Um, in my opinion, we can learn a lot in general from art and artistic thinking, especially in a society driven by efficiency and um, logic, the logic of exploitation. So, like you said, when Boyce says that every human being is an artist, he did not mean that we should all paint, but he was rather concerned with rediscovering the potential for action. So that society, like I already said, is not prefabricated as it sometimes appears, especially when, when viewed through a hyper-capitalistic um, glass, but is, to use boys' words, a uh, social sculpture. And I think with this he meant that we should together discuss desirable futures and not accept the status quo um, and with desirable futures, he doesn't mean that there's, or um, that's also my opinion, there, there is not one future that, um, that is possible, but there are many possible futures, but we have to keep in mind that they should be good or the most good for everyone and not only a small minority. And um, yeah, so it's, it's like we are asked to, to get creative in all areas of life, wherever we, we, we feel like there's our point where we want to interrupt. And I think that's very individual because some people feel like they want to, they have, they want to have an impact um, at school as teachers or, um, or they want to, to, to be as parents, they, they, can have, they, they can have an impact on their children. Um, but one thing that is very important to me when I talk about um, that we 
encourage people to see themselves as artists is that we don't all have the same preconditions and abilities. In particular, the, the scope for action that we have as individuals, but also as social groups is very different. So I think that's very important to keep in mind um, that we do not forget uh, that we don't have the same opportunities right now. Yeah. But this is especially the point, I think, um, that right now is a very good time to, to question this precisely, these structures. Like, why shouldn't art and culture be systemically relevant? Isn't it culture in the broadest sense that shapes society? And my hope is that more and more people will realize that we are more than only consumers, but artists in the way that we can shape and create healthy and more livable futures for everyone. And that this is a process um, that is on the one hand very small, but on the other hand, it's, it's big. It's like Maya Goethe once said, it's a incremental, um, like a radical incremental process. So it's a bit ambi that like um, ambivalent. Ambivalent, is this the right word? I'm not sure. You could but also say it's a bit paradoxical. Paradoxic, yeah. Um, small steps and huge impact kind of. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so, so that means that in our work to design kind of transformational projects, it might be important to include artists, but even more to include the creative and artistic part in ourselves. And what is perhaps another aspect that when we are uh, implementing change in complex settings, there will not be a perfect implementation plan. So there will always be the need to improvise. And again, improvisation is very closely related to artistic work. So I will come back to it, but now I want to go over to, to Maike. From what I've seen, Mayara hasn't yet arrived. So um, Maike, you're working at the Berlin Museum for Nature as a key person to lead transformational journey of the museum, which is in, it, in itself interesting. The Berlin Museum for Naturkunde, Berlin Museum for Nature is on a transformation journey since I think eight or 10 years. And uh, one of the uh, uh, outcomes of this or the aspects of this transformation journey is that you are also focusing on planetary health as a key perspective of your work. Um, so what made you, um, now I have forgotten the line. So planetary, so how, how is it, how is what you're doing now at the uh, at, uh, uh, Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin, how is this connected to what you touched earlier in your life? So kind of what is the connection between your own journey and your own visions to what you're doing now at the Museum at, for Naturkunde in Berlin? Yes, thank you, Martin, for this. Uh, yeah, first of all, for the invitation and also for the introduction and asking me this question, what um, a political theorist I and I worked um, yeah, um, at the university for six years um, doing my PhD on Hannah Arendt and the question, um, yeah, how nature can be integrated into political thought and political thinking, because I had, well, um, I came to the conclusion that there is not much of, um, of nature within political thought, at least Western political thought. So, yeah, but that is like maybe the end of the story. So, um, so I begin with the journey of the museum and our aim is really to become a change agent for nature um, as a natural history museum and um, yeah, be part um, of the transformation you're talking about, we are talking about to stop the destruction of ecosystems and reimagine a future for people and the planet. So um, what can be the part of, of, yeah, of a museum in this? And I think this resonates quite well with what you said, Marilena, um, how we embark on this transformational journey and um, what role can cultural institutions play? So planetary health is for us a very interesting concept because we can show that saving nature is actually also good for people and connect nature with society. So that is actually what we as a museum are already doing because we attract a lot of people um, as a natural history museum. And um, the ultimate goal is to really give the museum to the people um, and yeah, to have and foster these 
important discussions how we can shape our futures. And we strongly believe that we have to bring um, together people from different backgrounds and different perspectives to, to start this journey. And this now brings me to my own background um, and Hannah Arendt. Um, because um, Arendt has a very powerful notion of politics. He said, this is acting in concert. Politics only happens when people from different backgrounds, different perspectives um, come together um, yeah, uh, around a, a shared goal, um, with, but with these different perspectives and start acting together towards these goals. And um, so this is not a, an instrumental concept of politics, but something that sets up yeah, that, that sets free the power of, of the people um, to, and to actually believes in the ability to, to, change, to change the world. So, and um, this was something I was working on quite theoretically at the university doing my PhD. And I was attracted to the museum because I was seeking a place where actually these kind of discussions would take place. So and now our journey is to to open up the space for discussions and actually really give the space to different groups. And um, yeah, one small example is that we gave the museum to the Fridays for Future movement to meet scientists in the museums to start these kind of conversations. So that is something, Martin, you, you hinted at that sometimes like small steps may can lead to, to, to big changes. And um, so that is something, yeah, I quite strongly believe in that, um, we have to the power to change the world if you just start acting together, even in small steps. Um, so, but of course, one has to think if we think about transformations, what kind of institutions um, we have to build, um, what is the power structures we we move in. So this is something because sometimes when you work with Hannah Arendt and her concept of politics, this may in the first place sound quite naive. So just come together and change the world. This has some power, but sometimes people say this is quite a normative concept or a naive concept. So because there are these power structures we have to fight against. Um, um, Marilina, you mentioned capitalism. So there is so much um, so uh, that yeah might seem to stand against that um, yeah um, the actual possibility of change. But um, yeah, so I think Hannah Arendt gives us. Um, the power to believe in the ability of people to change. So, what is very interesting is the concept you're you're, you're sharing, kind of of the museum. You are saying we, as a museum, see ourselves as a change agent, and we want to give the museum back to people, which is kind of changing what you usually expect from a museum. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a very uh, a museum with a very long tradition. I think it has been around for about 200 years. Yeah, And it's right in the middle of Berlin, kind of all the powerful institutions and governments and, and ministries and large institutions, they're all within a parameter of two kilometers around the museum. So here you are kind of showing kind of that, that you will be a change agent for nature. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, you are kind of on a constantly on a on a in in, in a transformation project, also with your uh, kind of cooperations with Humboldt University, with all the universities of Berlin, with Charité, and so on and so forth. So you also experience kind of the difficulties and the ambiguities of going through changes. But before we go there, I want to ask you about two things which are also critical to Anna Arendt's thinking, in addition to what you have mentioned, that politics is kind of the space that emerges when we work in concert, is she's very strong on that we can begin something new. And independent of how powerful someone might see, look from the outside, you can never predict from where the change will come. So we, we are talented for beginning something new. And the other is, that she's connecting power with this kind of the understanding of opening up the spaces of possibility, yeah, which I in, in principle are infinite. So there are huge spaces of possibility. And when we come together, kind of they can incarnate, they can materialize in between us. Perhaps you can say a bit more about these two key notions because it, it's gonna be a big question for all of us as change agents. Where do we, do we begin something new? And the beginning of something new can also be in a very old and traditional organization and institution. 
Um, and the other is how can, how is this spaces of possibility connected to kind of the experience and the, the execution of power? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Martin. You already said it so beautifully that I have to think about what I can add to this, to these two notions you mentioned that we are, um, yeah, we have the possibility to to begin something new, new through political action. So this is very interesting. Maybe I start with Hannah Arendt's very interesting concept of power, because she says power and violence are two very different things. And what she means with power is that power comes once the people start acting together power emerges so that power is um, something that no institution and no violence in the world can stand against once it's executed through acting together through the people so this is a quite an yeah i would say an, an empowerment version of power um hannah Arendt offers to us and and she says new beginnings always happen when people start acting together um and she has a very beautiful notion of what politics is. She says politics is uh, taking care of the world. And I would suggest that we could, when she says world, she does not really imply nature, but I think this con concept really, um, yeah, could, could take this on board that, that nature is part of our world. And by acting together, by taking care of the world, we are already in the middle of um, yeah, this new, thing that is happening because for Hannah Arendt there is always uh, even in the darkest times the possibilities to start something new so um, but you need um, you need the, the different people you need the plurality of people for that so this is not an instrumental question for her so so we need the multiple voices and all the voices there are so convening the people and there I come back to the museum what we try to be is a we try to be the convener, not being ourselves the change agent, but the, the, give, but the space where people come together to create these new ideas and um, come up with new solutions. Um, and we invite people from all areas of society, so, so like scientists, politicians, um, business people, um, so people from all areas of society to, to come together um, and um, yeah, create these new beginnings and new ideas because yeah, that is happening. And Hannah Arendt has some trust that this will always happen once people start um, yeah, acting together in, and have this space of freedom. So um, this is a quite optimistic concept, but I think we need this in our times. So to have some hope that we actually can change something even in our complex um, global societies. Now you have also created within the museum an experimental space, which is pretty much a large space for convening, mm -hmm. for uh, where workshops can take place, where people can meet. But it's it's not a small space; it's a really a huge space, and uh, you're using this for one place for 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 people to meet up. Also, one thing you have done: you have invited us, Kluge, um, to 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 have an office at the museum. There's also a connection in the same office. We have some people from from Oxford who are there. So there is this. It's also a space where you invite people in, where you feel they are sharing this vision. So so that we have this place where different players can come come together and do their work and kind of further work on their ideas. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you want to share a bit about the experience you have with creating these experimental spaces within the museum. Yeah, and this is the idea we we will expand in the future. So this is just like for us the beginning, the, the experimentierfeld experimental space where we actually have a space within the exhibitions where we invite people, like mostly scientists, who show their work to get into dialogue, dialogue with our visitors. Um, but also, I've already mentioned it, Fridays for Future coming into the museum, having workshops. Um, yeah, with with scientists and come together for for dialogue. So this is the idea I mentioned before, um, giving the museum to people. So not having a program that is so actually created by us, by the museum professionals, but by different actors. And also, the, yeah, it is important for us, and that's why it's called experimental space. So sometimes people get that wrong and think, okay, I can uh, watch um, science experiments there. No, it is an experimental space that is in itself an experiment where we experiment yeah, with bringing different people together in different formats and, and test um, 
yeah, what actually creates new knowledge, what creates um, some energy um, for people. And yeah, just today we, we had a reflection session on um, the years we had now, the, the first phase of the experimental field. And we are thinking how we can um, yeah, expand this idea and also bring it um, yeah, um, into the city. So um, perhaps some people know it, we have uh, the big future plan where we will rebuild the museum and where we will have a phase where we have to close the museum because of constructions. So we are thinking to move this experimental field, this experimental space out of the museum into the city um, and yeah, even maybe into, into other areas. Um, so to 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 expand this idea um, of the museum, like out you know, the museum outside the museum, to create spaces there, and so I'm like looking forward to these kind of experiments and uh, what we can contribute to these yeah transformations um, that we see and these discussions we see in in society right now. What have been the reactions of the visitors? Because from the outside, as if you first listen to it, it sounds a bit crazy. Yeah, and I can imagine that some of the kind of board of the museum might have been a bit skeptical. So what is what has been the reactions over the last five years? Are more yeah. visitors coming? Are they shying away and saying this is too crazy for us? Actually, no, most people are very curious and they are, um, yeah, so sometimes they are quite disappointed when nothing is happening there and at the experimental field. So because it's quite hard to fill it all the time. So, so but um, so I, the people are actually quite open um, if they yeah encounter um, different formats and and projects there. And so um, yeah, so I think this is something that is actually yeah maybe not so surprising that people actually come and want to experience things in the museum. And when we ask them, they want more of that kind of experiences and participate in science, for example. So um, there is um, within our service and our visitor research, we strongly see uh, yeah, the, the curiosity of people and the willingness to participate um, in experiments. And actually they want to participate in science even more than participate in dialogue formats. And that is something that is really interesting. So. Um, People are curious and they want to embark and want to be part um, of the things we do. So, and I well, think we could do a, a lot of more things and experiments and even more, be quite more, more, even more experimental and uh, more creative. And um, so. Thank you very much. We will continue the conversation. From what I see, Mayara is not showing up. So something must have happened to her. Either she has a problem with the connectivity um, so we will find out, probably not today, I've written her a mail, but uh, she hasn't answered, um, and we will see if we perhaps can invite her to one of the next lectures if she is not able to join later. Um, I want to go back to uh, Marilena. Marilena, you started your podcast, I don't know exactly when, um, and it's now running, so you started also this work on, on fostering transformative uh, literacy about one, two years ago. So what was the journey and what is the reaction from people and where are you compared to one year ago? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, the podcast, that's a simple answer, the podcast I started in the end of 2017, but with a completely different format. But I think one thing that I already mentioned in the beginning of this conversation was that I, I felt something touched me. So I felt that if I put my words outside, if I connect with other people that might feel the same, even like if, if it's um, the feeling that um, I want to have an impact on, on transforming our planet, or in feeling a little bit helpless in this transformation or just being in the beginning of this journey because I haven't started when I was uh, 12, like, like uh, Greta or some other um, activists. So I think that was one of my touching points. And well, the, the reaction was, was very positive until today because I think one 
or what, one thing that I al always try to not do is being um, like um, holding up like the moral, um, like being very morally, I'm not sure how to say that, like coming from above. So rather I, I, I like to meet people on the same height and um, just sharing, sharing different perspectives on, on these topics um, whether it's the, 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 the change of the structure of how we, of, of mobility or the, the health system or um, our nutrition. Um, because I'm not the expert in this, I'm more the one that explores all this. And by, by the, in this process, I'm, I'm learning so much. So um, my, I think my, what I what I do in this process and where I feel like what helps people uh, engaging is when they meet other people um, they can connect with and they can they can learn from rather than or like they can learn together rather than having someone telling them how things are and how things should be. But more like Micah also said, people want to interact. I think some of our modern structures in the system or in, in the modern system, um, not that they are all capitalistic, but some of their the capitalistic structures have made us a bit comfortable. Um, we have a lot of things that we are concerned with in our everyday life, whether it's our mobile phone, it's our work, it's the the efficiency um, ideology that we should all be like happy all the time and find a job that makes us um, fulfilled. So we are very concerned, or a lot of people are very concerned with their individual life, which is completely understandable because, like in in our everyday life, we we concentrate on this because we can't always have like the bigger picture in mind every every moment. But I think it's a C part of my work in especially this part to 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 broaden up that there's that we are not these we are these little islands but all these islands are interconnected mm -hmm. and maybe it's quite fun in the beginning to to make the own life more like greater and more fulfilling but it's even a better feeling to make the life better for not only myself but for others as well. So that was, I think, yeah. Kind this of is one of your key drivers to connect people on a kind of high level, kind of on one to one, but also to many. So, so to, to create a, a quality connectivity with people, is this one of the things that makes you happy? Definitely. I think it's, it's, um, it's, probably a little bit egoistic, but I myself like to connect. And I think that this is one of my strengths to, um, to interact with different people and to bring together different perspectives. So um, like in 2019, I started a little project, um, like a social project, which was called Zukunftskunst, so like uh, future artists. <laughs> and um, our idea was um, to, to meet to let different um, sectors or people of different sectors meet like civilians to to politicians um, people from the economy um, and also who else um, are activists artists so different areas of um, people from different areas where they are maybe experts in and to to discuss different topics um, of a local area, which was Hamburg because I live here and um, to create real projects because I myself think like Micah just said before that we definitely need more real level laboratories, more real um, utopian places, places that can be used as lighthouses for other places. I think like that Micah's museum is a perfect um, example for a, for a place that once, I mean, a museum is, is, is an idea that someone once had and thought, oh, let's 
very simplistic said, hang up some pictures and let people look on it. That's one possibility to use in a mu museum. But there are so many other options, possibilities, how a museum could be. And I think this, this process can be um, um, worked or yeah, yeah, worked out in, in, in all areas of life, whether it's mobility, it's health, it's every little object can be transformed together. And it's, it's like the, the, the output will be the best, I think, if we have all people in this process and um, a variety of people. Um, I also want to bring in more Hannah and Sophie, who are both having a, a Health for Future background. And uh, uh, Hannah, perhaps I start with you. You were working with Health for Future, and I want to pick up on what Marilena was pointing to the relevance of connectivity, of diversity, to reaching out to people you would normally not reach out to, and then to work on something, projects which are really on the critical path, not just anything which is interesting, but really we have, a, a, you know, it's on a critical path. So what is your experience in reaching out and building connectivity and talking to um, uh, 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 kind of members of parliament and so on and so forth? What are you learning? How is this for you? Yeah, maybe I'll start by adding to the idea of, of collectives uh, from my personal perspective. So I know times in which I feel pretty depressed about many things going on in our world and, and just not changing um, and all the injustice and questions like how can this be and but then I also know times in which I feel the energy to do something and in the past this has always developed together with other like-minded people so it's um, yeah I, I this idea of a new beginning um, when people meet and connect, I, I know this as a feeling from, from the Health for Future movement, and it gives me a lot of energy. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, I, in, in our activism, I think we often experience that things do move and things do change. Um, and it might be small steps, but then um, a lot of small steps can maybe give bigger steps together. And, um, through meeting people with other opinions and trying to convince people, um, we we make the experience that that yeah having visions and telling people about what our worries are, but also what our visions are um, can can make a difference. Yeah. Also, we we just open the discussion. So also for 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 Mike and Marilena, if you want to interact and jump uh, jump in whenever you want, you can do that. But Sophie, perhaps you can add, and I, I really would like to also know from you when you part of our work is to, to reach out to people we would not normally talk to. You know, sometimes it's, a, it's a people high up in hierarchy. It's a people uh, more from a political background which are not close to useful, for example. And when we do that, what is happening when we reach out and have a good conversation with them? I think different things. Um, so if, if it goes, well, uh, there's this joint feeling of a joint vision that they see what we're heading towards. There are, of course, the resistances. And then sometimes it can feel quite challenging and frustrating if people don't echo the vision we have for, for special, because of vested interests, because of uh, maybe lack of imagination. We do know that there's an imagination challenge. But what I think is really important is that, as Hannah said, we are coming back, even, even if we do sometimes feel frustration to to other like-minded people within our community and also people we connected with that are now on on joining in the same vision of the future um and also that um and i think that's something that's really strong in the movement that i really like have fun on the way have enjoy uh working on this uh, there's this saying um if i can't dance it's not my revolution and i think that's that's really powerful and something that you always have to make sure that you're working towards well-being in the future, but you should also be well on the way there. And I think that's something that our movement quite well achieves. Which I think is really, really important. And it is also connected with something uh, which is again a core, core notion of Hannah Arendt, which is when you work like this on a political engagement, building a project, allowing the diversity of people to be present, kind of with the plurality, with the diversity and something that matters, there's something that she calls public happiness. So the happiness on work on that, kind of what is emerging between us. 
So it's not something where we only suffer and we have to give up. It's actually making us happy. You meet people you would never meet. You build friendships uh, on a political level or an engagement levels that are quite exciting. And what I have seen is when you share this, it's actually very infectious to people. So for example, yesterday I was in a joint session with Harald Lesch in the Regenburg Sustainability Days. And uh, through, the, through our joint engagements, we are now good friends. So we did this together. And normally we have three parts and we would all give our lectures and then a bit of questions at the end. This time the third part, which was exactly on transformative action, we did jointly in a conversation. And my sense was through the friendships that we have and through the struggling that we have of moving forward with these ideas, it was kind of much more convincing that if we would have done it individually through a good presentation, which of course we can both do. So I think it's very important to see how can we be uh, kind of fulfilled and rich in our work and how can we kind of uh, share that so that others are invited but everyone others. So for example, we got a very enthusiastic reaction from a member of uh, the conservative party here in Germany, who said he was so convinced from what we were sharing and then he was kind of joining in. I now see um, that Mayara, I think is in, huh? Yeah, Mayara. Hi. Hi, I think I, I missed the time zone. I oh, was... we made a mistake or we both made a mistake, but now you are here. I'm so sorry for all that's watching. It's really, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's the whole session is about uh, having a good life and also dealing with the experimental part of our work and kind of finding a different, um, even a different relation when we have a misunderstanding or mistakes occur. It doesn't matter at all. We will have a wonderful session jointly with you. So now to the others, we shift focus. Very welcome, Mayara, and we already had introduced you. And uh, perhaps the next 10 minutes, uh, uh, you know, I will give you a few questions and then we also will let the others uh, and also the, the audience come in with questions and comments. Um, so you are, we have heard from the introduction, you're working on so many different fields, kind of you're a family doctor yourself, you are a part of the uh, working group on planetary health of the uh, Wonka, this is the World Alliance of Family Doctors, you're also working with the Lancet Countdown on, on, on uh, climate change and health. You are, uh, uh, you have with a team developed a course on planetary health in Portuguese and Brazil with more than 1,000 participants. And you have also done a course with, uh, uh, for, the, for the planetary health, for the, for the family health uh, doctors on a global scale. So you have immense energy. You also shared last time with me, you're working with a group of people to block uh, the building of a coal plant in, um, coal power plant in, in Porto Alegre. So where, where is this immense energy and creativity in your engagement? Where is it coming from? What is the source of this energy and drive of yours? Thank you, Martin. Again, I'm sorry for being a bit, uh, being late. I, I got a, the wrong time zone. It's the first time that this happens, but anyway, thank you. So I'm talking now from Brazil. I'm a Brazilian family doctor. And I'm still working the front line in this horrible thing that we are living in Brazil. And, uh, you know, the answer to find time for all these things, I think it's passion, like, or the urgency as well. So I couldn't find it if I didn't feel the urgency and the, and the passion that I, that I feel. So, and I like, how couldn't, I be involved with the fight against the construction of the largest coal mine, open coal mine of Latin America. Like I cannot. And it, it wasn't a city that I was living in. I just moved it to another city. But uh, how I could, I couldn't really like how you could live in a place that will be constructed the largest coal mine and just watch it. You can, like if you have, uh, kind of some a little bit of power and knowledge and knowledge is a bit of power you need to work a lot to 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 uh, 
construct a better world, a better place for us to live. And uh, with a cold mind, this will not happen. It was just being uh, horrible for health and everything. And uh, the course, uh, the courses, because we have the first version was in Portuguese, we translated it, to, it into English with the help of the Planetary Health Alliance. And then we created with the Wonka Working Party. The Wonka is the World Organization of Family Doctors. We created the, the course for primary care. All of them are launched and we make it free and accessible for all and with certification and everything. There is no like some mis that you feel that you, you will need to pay at some point. This will not happen. And we created to be like uh, to work with low bandwidth of the internet. So it's accessible and was a huge work with like designers and uh, working with coordinating many people to write the thing. So it's a huge task, but it's also like how I couldn't do that. Because if we think about like uh, climate change, if we look at that, we'll see uh, that we have many, many studies. It's proven, it's no, uh, we don't have like how to uh, discuss this, it's proven. But uh, the problem that I perceived is that science isn't enough. We cannot solve things just with the science. And then of course that we need arts, communication, but one of the big things is education. So I, when I started to talk about climate change with my peers, like other doctors, they would say, oh, that's something for ambientalists, from environmentalists, that's not something for, for doctors or whatever. And uh, then I started to realize that I need to work with education. People need to know things so they can like understand that this is a problem. And science alone, it's really important. I don't want to say that it isn't, but science alone couldn't be like, couldn't deal with all of this. So that's why I created the course when I realize it. And then I start, I stay also doing like, we, I, I am part of a team of podcasts and I start, I, I stay keeping doing like communication things that I think it's another branch that we need to communicate about these things. So that's a little bit of, uh, but Mayara, yeah. I mean, you're pointing to it needs education, it needs communication. But from what I have heard of you and also about how you work with people, there's something special about what you want to bring into education and into communication. Because we all understand if it would be done like any other course at any other university, it probably wouldn't work. So what, what are you trying to build into this educational or communicational work, also in the way you work with your team? What is uh, the spirit you try to establish and create. Sure, that's one good story that I think that illustrates that, Martin, is that we have one of the guys that were helping to record the things for the course. He was like, a, he studies, uh, he was in finishing her degree on social science and he never have heard about planetary health. And then I start to talk with him and talk with the designers that didn't know as well the, the term and uh, uh, everyone uh, decided to do the course. They didn't just develop it, they decided to go through. And this, this guy uh, who have like recorded it got so involved with that that he even helped when we review it to add some parts on some, uh, on some of the materials, like on some of the modules. And uh, he did his conclusion like uh, work about uh, including planetary health. And then he's one of the best advocates. So that's one thing about that, that's in the working of this, I try to bring like interest, love, and, I, and that's the thing about making it with our like hands, because it's, of course it's a massive online course, but it has something of the artisans of making, like I, my hand is in every letter in the course. It's in every uh, design. It and and it's. I didn't want to create it a bad environment for the, for developing the course. So I, I really want to a safe environment and then where people can also exercise the creativity. So I couldn't do that if I was like too, like straight 
or I need to sometimes, but trying to bring like the love and the, the thing that we need to be together. There is just one way that we will be out, that we will get out of this crisis that we are living. It's together. That's my thing that I know. We just can find a way to get out of the crisis and work it's together. And it's important that we keep this together to, Togetherness. I don't know if this word exists in, in English, but that we get together to solve the things. And so it's not, I am one of the figures of that, but I'm not the only one. There is a whole team and this team approach, it's really important. So it's very much in the way you relate and the way you see that it only can happen together, which is connecting to one thing that Michael was saying before, she's also on the panel. She was talking about politics as taking care of the world and nature to jointly taking care. So we had before also in our conversations this, this whole theme of connectivity, of making connections with people. You connect with a designer, you connect with a social scientist who has no idea and you treat him as someone who can take care of the planet and take care of the world and we can jointly do that. So the togetherness is in itself a very important part of what we are kind of communicating to people. And even if you talk to a politician who is perhaps from a, from a party which is, you're critical to, you still try to build up the connectivity so that they can share into this joint vision of we can jointly take care of the planet and, uh, and, and the world and of each other. So it's, uh, and, and what is also interesting, the way you're saying in each detail, in each letter, we're doing it with our hands. We're doing it with passion. We're doing it with love. Yeah, and uh, uh, that's, I think, many of the themes we had before, we had also the theme of that everyone can be an artist. So there is an art of creating the future together. So that was one of Marilena themes. So, um, Michael, Marilena, Hannah, who wants to also join into the conversation? Because we said in the second part, we will just have a discussion in the group and then we will also in a few minutes let in comments and questions from the, from the plenary. We also now have Sabina who has joined. She can also chip in if she wants. So who wants to say something? Michael, please. Yeah, so just Mayara, before you came, we were just talking, um, yeah, Martin brought into the discussion the notion of public happiness, that is actually, to act together, it's actually, even though we are dealing with huge problems and actually a crisis, it brings joy to work together with people towards a, a shared goal, and that is something, and I just wanted to bring the story of Hannah Arendt, who says, there's often a tragedy to these kinds of movements because you create this joy and this feeling of acting together. But if you do not secure with institutions and keep the level of, of this happiness, it can be easily forgotten. And it always happened to revolutions in the past, quite. And Hannah Arendt said, it's always is forgotten. In modernity, the joy of acting together is, is, is present, but it's so often forgotten. We have to preserve it. And we have to think about how we can create societies and institutions that preserve um, the space of freedom where we can act together and take care of the world and the planet. And, and so this is maybe a question for all of you. Um, what are the ideas for these kind of institutions? Or maybe we can adapt our existing democratic institutions um, for, for serving this goal, because this is something that is really important to think of it, in, even though it may be uh, tempting to just uh, foster this feeling of um, of common action, joint action, but but often movements they they fail at um, thinking about institutions and preserving their energy um, in late for later time once the once the movement has peaked. And um, so this is really my my curious question: if you have ideas or if you have um, already yeah um, if you're already acting in this in this direction. Mayara, please. Sure. Uh, like uh, one of the things, I, I will use the example of the course. Uh, the, uh, we have hosted it in a public university, in a free software, or it's not software, but a free something for create a course. Open source, uh, I don't remember exactly the name, I'm sorry. 
but uh, so this is we use it, this public uh, university space which in brazil it's uh, we don't pay anything it, actually university helps the students well before the bolsonaro's or current government it was better but to, it, we are still we struggle and fight every day for it keeping like keeping it uh, public and accessible for all so we use it, the, the structure of the universe, which is called Tele Saúde, which is one of their projects to create the course. So uh, we are very, we feel that we are very secure that it, it's not something that will disappear like uh, on the next month or on the next year. So this is one of the things we do have the, the structure of the public universe and then we use it. it I intentionally choose it. And it uh, curiously, it wasn't like, it doesn't have like support for English. So we have like worked with the programmers and everything to create it out of this. It's not perfect. If any of you, you can do the course. If any of you do it, it's not perfect, but it is like, um, it's still being built and constructed and this, this thing. So of course that if you went to a, a paid platform, maybe we will have all of this more like ready, but, uh, one of the things for myself is that the students of the course are not profitable. They are, it's not for profit. Profit. I, I haven't do any of these uh, for profit. We are not getting money from that. We are getting a better world. And some sometimes they commodify things. It's one of the things for, for us to decolonize and think in a, in a other way to see the world. So that's like my experience is try to bring to our what the what is the public thing that we already have that we can like work with and and like create space on that. But that's from exactly it's in a very like small example from my reality. I think what is also really is it, to your question, Mike, is there is a question first: How can we create it in the projects we are doing now? And there's a second question, how can more of us understand what is special about it and what are the conditions to keep kind of to that it is there. And then there is a third then when we are building larger institutions or participating in larger institutions like you in the museum or with universities or you are with universities or in global organizations, how can we create the spaces there, but it, I think it's very important to keep it as one of the things that if we are not also creating in our project spaces that are attractive. Where we feel happiness in, in between where we have a, a deep level of respect for each other, where we have a culture where we can struggle and have conflicts with each other. So it's if we are needing strong cultures, because that's what we deserve so that we can have real strong struggles and strong conflicts and still kind of are connected. Um, so, but it's very, very important to keep this question of yours alive. Yeah, Marilena, please. I just had a thought that starts a little bit earlier, not in the process where, um, where in a, where a structure already exists, where people are building up and connect, but before that, that it actually needs a lot of space and time that people are able to engage themselves in such a uh, project. That's something I, I myself struggle with. And I would say I'm quite privileged uh, in a quite privileged position. But if you, for example, there has always been this discussion about, for example, Fridays for Future, um, why there are so many academics in this, um, in, this, uh, in this movement. And I think if we are talking about um, societal transformation, um, towards a better and healthier world, it also should include that we are enabling people to have the time. And I just read, because you were talking about Haradesh, I just read a book um, where he was a co-author that was about how time and climate change are interconnected. Um, and I think that's so true that we need time to act together, to be political. If we are all the time concerned with um, earning money and some people have like three, four, five jobs. Um, they are they 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 have to to work um, to to earn enough money. Then we can't expect from them to be um, politic politically active. 
not because they they are too lazy or they are not interested in it but i think it's very important to to keep that in mind that yeah that to to be able to to connect with each other and be politically active um it needs the the structure and especially people who are already who already have maybe the time who are in a privileged privileged position can help others to to have this time as well and i think just yesterday the the project of the um what is it called bedingungsloses grundeinkommen in in english the the idea is people get money um basic with no income. conditions yeah. Yeah. yeah basic income thank you um with no conditions so they get i think it was 1200 euros every month for three years as a as a um, experiment and i myself i'm very interested if people will start for example to to work more politically to be more active to engage more with each other um so yeah that was just a thought that i had when i heard um especially my i think it's very important because one of the key facets of our work is also to the, the question of um uh uh justice climate justice justice yeah so that and of course when we start many of us start with small groups in a certain setting and it's important that we over time have the intention to be more inclusive and reach people who have not been kind of infected not been participating to include them in mm -hmm. um since we are also coming to the last half hour of our session sophie i would invite you to just share some comments and questions from the audience so that we can include it into our discussion, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, there have been a lot of discussion and comments and visions in the chat. So thank you very much for that. I'll start with one vision and one challenge. So uh, the vision um, is from Jule and I'll just read it out. My vision for the future is a world in which we value and shape the relationships we have with other people more. And these relationships are no longer imbued with a heteronormative and capitalistic logic of growth. I believe in an, in an anti-capitalist revolutionary transformation that leads us to a state where a fulfillment of human needs in a life-friendly way is possible. We need a world in which climate justice is created and maintained through emancipatory processes, cooperation, solidarity, and decentralized collective self-determination. We also need a world in which we can be free from racism and anti-feminism, and in which we understand and value our dependence and therefore inseparability from the ecosystem that surrounds us. Only in this way can we achieve more climate justice and thus more health justice. And, uh, and a challenge that Julia raises, I think a very big challenge is how to reach groups of society that resent change, that are afraid of change in general and therefore oppose it. More specifically, people who are afraid of economic losses, job losses, changes in culture and everyday life. My notion is that we rarely reach and engage people from these groups, rather those that are already open for change. So who wants to uh, comment to the challenge, Mayara? I I just want to share um, that we have many indigenous people in Brazil, and but we were they being really attacked by the government now and Amazon? I don't think this is like a, something really new for who is watching or here, but that's a huge crisis that we are facing. But we have a leadership called. David Kopenawa, he's an old man and from the Yanoma, Yanomami indigenous uh, people. And he said in his book that the sky is falling down and that we need to dance for putting the skies up and then we need to change the way that we live. And like years, years ago, like 40 years ago, he and the, we got the enchanted people from the forest. They were saying that uh, as much as we uh, dig on the earth, uh, the biggest is the hole in the sky. 
isn't this like really talking about like climate change but this is like way before that we we see and then in their knowledge uh they say that uh the non-indigenous people like they do eat too much they do much shit as well and this is one of the things that we need to change in the way that we live and uh, many is also that we are like losing the pleasure of life and i think that we connect what we were say we were talking earlier and uh, that we need so then to dance to sustain um the sky uh in in the sky to sustain the sky so this is one of the things that i just i was just remembering when when you're reading uh sophie the questions and i i think like one of the answers is like us to listen the indigenous people not just listen but um, try to respect and try to incorporate many of the things that they want to teach us like do we want to see a, constru a construction of a house that's really, really uh, sustainable? Go to an indigenous place. Everything is sustainable. The way that they live, everything. There is nothing new that we need to invent. That, like uh, many times uh, we see like uh, huge mach machines to take, uh, to decar decarbonize the atmosphere. What do you think about trees? Like things are simple that what we need to change, like the way that we eat, the way that we live, the way that we, and then uh, the more developed countries, they have many comfort, a lot of comfort and the riches have a lot of comforts that we need to think about that and uh, how to think in a more like, um, compassionate community but i think we have the answers are just on in front of us we just need to be uh, able to see it i also want to comment on the challenge of uh, uh, what are we doing with groups who are resenting change when i was uh, starting my work as um, working on transformation in the health sector 30 years ago i had a first uh, contact to a, to a large city who had a large hospital and they were wanting to do a project with nurses and the nurses were resenting change they said, they said uh, uh, we are not we don't want to do them we, have, we already have too much work to do and now you ask us to do all kind of funny questionnaires and do additional things we're not willing to do it so the manager of the of the city was i was just getting to know them he was asking what would you do and I was reflecting for a moment and then I said, I would go to the people and listen to them. I have no plan. I would just go to them and listen to them. And what I meant by that, and I think that's what he understood is listening, not just going there and listening through the motions, but really going there and listening and seeing how is the situation? What do they need? Do they have a willingness to join in if, they have, if it makes sense? What would be required for them to join in, even if it makes sense? So that was that is perhaps something when people resent change that create changes where you can listen. And if we can listen, we will oftentimes find ways uh, to to change our approach to to kind of tell the story differently and so on and so forth. It's one of the things to, and no one of us is a master of listening. So it's an ongoing challenge to. Also go to, sesh, to, to settings which are uncomfortable for us, where we normally would not go to listen. Um, so any other comments or more points from, from uh, the audience? Sophie, please. Yes, I, I just want to add that there's a comment that fits very well with what you both just said. Um, one person says that it's their wish that different professions work together and not see each other as rivals, but as colleagues who have one shared goal for keeping society healthy. So it's about listening to other professions, listening to clients affected and listening mindful to nature. And I think that's just what you just described. And uh, another comment is the wish for participatory research so that actually um, these people can be heard um, when, it get, when, when we're talking about solutions. And I maybe some one story I want to um, share 
is also um, uh, one participant shared that uh, Bond University in Australia changed their medical program to involve sustainability in healthcare, which involves projects with the indigenous communities to learn about their wisdom regarding planetary health. And one amazing finding was that these communities do not distinguish human health from planetary health. Um, and I think that adds very well onto what Mar Maya was saying. Other comments or questions from the audience or other comments from the group from here from us? Yeah, Marilena, please. One of my thoughts uh, towards the, the, um, the struggle or the, the comment, uh, the second one was that I think if people feel afraid of losing something, this frightness, frightens might be correct because they might lose something if we change the structure of society or different parts of it. But I think it's it's probably not the, the right way to just go over this, this feeling of fright, but to make them realize and mostly the, or often, not always, but often these people are in positions where they have a lot of power and they might lose this power. And to realize that the, the things they feel they own, they are not really their own, they, like of their ownership. And if they have this power or this capital or whatever it is they own and they're afraid of losing, it is because they are exploiting other people. And probably some of them already know this, but there's one very interesting experiment in the philosoph philosophical philosophy experiment um, where you imagine that you, you will be born, but you don't know in which class you will be born. And you have to structure society. And how would you structure society if you don't know if you are born as a rich, rich man or woman in, in, in Germany, or you are born somewhere in Bangladesh as someone who works in, a, in, a, in, in the um, knitting industry. So how would then society look if you don't know with which capital you are born with? So yeah, making people clear that ownership is not something normal and um, that we should, that yeah, things could be very different. Uh, is something that I think it's very important and not to just go over the feelings of, of everyone uh, who might feel afraid because I think then we don't gain anything. Yeah. Um, sometimes what is needed for, for also going through the difficulties is an, a bigger story. So for example, what we all know as doctors or nurses, um, when you have a very harsh diagnosis people are willing to actually do things they never would do because there is a chance to go beyond it and still have a good life, yeah? So uh, building on the urgency that Mayara was, was talking about, it is clear that we have a very urgent and very kind of harsh diagnosis we have to, to, to work with. So it is important in our communications that we make this clear also, especially as health professionals, we have an authority to do that. And then uh, uh, kind of communicate what is possible and what will happen and what is uh, the opportunity of going beyond and doing, going onto the path that we, are, that we are on. Because that's another thing that people are thinking if we, are, if we would not do the actions that are necessary, there would not be a losing of anything, but we are already losing through, through dirty air. We are already losing through what we are eating. We are already losing through what is happening with climate change. So, so there is in a way, it's also important to share that in a way that we own the status quo so that we then can see what is the path to a good and healthy life. And if some of the measures we are suggesting, we will have very immediate uh, uh, kind of benefits and, and, and so that's again there's this question of what is a, what is the story that we are telling and from which place are we telling it? Maya talked about love, about passion, about uh, uh, kind of uh, an idea of how it can be about taking care of togetherness. So you're talking you're talking from the place of togetherness to other, which is a, a very different place than from above or from 
kind of from outside. Um, Sophie, do we have more comments from the audience that you want to share? Yes, um, I think one we touched a bit upon um, because we talked about the fact that it's so easy to feel despair and that one and something that also was characterized as eco and anxiety, which is a very normal and probably very justified feeling um, in the context of the state of the, the earth and the planet. Um, and that creating joint visions like we're doing now here collectively is one way to counter that and to get into action. And one participant asked um, about forms and spaces and and uh, places where actually these kind of conversations can happen and um, where we can collectively imagine this to go to, uh, towards a healthy and a good future for us all and maybe if you have one or two concrete examples of where these kind of conversations can happen or wishes where they should happen that you would want to share anyone has an example we do have like the Planetary Health Alliance group on Hilo, which is where many conversations happen. We do have in the, the course, uh, the Planetary Health course, we do have forums. Many people change things there. And, uh, but you also need to think, of course, we are bringing a global perspective here, uh, at least an American and European perspective here. But we need to also think um, locally. So we need to start talking with your family, with your community. Uh, one of I do I don't know what is the name in English compostage, where you put like your food and then transform it into into mm -hmm. it's compostage. I don't know how 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 you say it in English. In German, it's compost. What okay, is so. <laughs> What is it in English? Same. I don't know. Compost and composting. <laughs> okay, so okay. I do composting, and then I, all the time that I I bring the composting to to like uh, I put on on play, public places, so this uh, start many conversations. Like, uh, and then many people decide to start composting after they discussed about composting when when I was like putting on, on in a public place. So many times your actions will also be a way to talk about this. So if you don't eat meat and then you, you certainly will be asked why you don't eat meat. And then you can do, a, a, sometimes people are very like straight in, but you can construct like a conversation about the the climate and everything that is interconnected so you also should be able to com communicate locally it's it has a lot of potential so do not forget to talk about this in your own community and start to changing things locally there's one example also sabina you were present when we had our first meeting of clucs the founding meeting the first two hours was a round of 15 people sharing what triggered them to be here. Very personally, why are you here? And in a way, in this sharing of the first two hours, it was both what triggered me, what kind of made me sad or what was difficult, but also the vision was already there of togetherness, of what we, I would like to do more. So one thing that every one of you can do who is listening get three friends together, five friends, and ask them what is triggering you to be concerned about this work that we are doing? What is touching you personally? And in that, there is also the vision. What, is, what, what, what kind of life would you like to have more? What are you seeing as being possible? What could be a starting point? What are you most passionate about? It's also one of the things that I always say when people ask, where should I start? And I ask them, what are you most passionate about? Start where your passion is and then follow your path because there's no right starting point except the ones that you are creating. So that's something everyone can do, creating these spaces where people share personally, because what emerges is connectivity, is connection. And Sabine, if you go back, you remember when Christian Witt was sharing, you were sharing, Sylvia was sharing, there was a sense of community after two hours. And from there, from that we created Klug. And I think that you actually, when you're passionate about something, it's like an inner guiding star that tells you where you should be going. <laughs> so when your eyes are shining, you're reading something like, oh, wow, this, this is for me, then that's where you should be heading, basically. 
probably some inner compass. <laughs> and, and when you create this with others, and um, then it's even, even stronger than if it's just for yourself. Actually, I also wanted to mention before with the change thing that, of course, everything changes all the time. So if you talk about people don't like change, like you already said it partly, Martin, like what is the alternative? Yeah. So one is the change that will happen to you. And the other is the change that you together with others are, um, how do you say, gestalten, like you're, you're shaping with others, like what world do you want? And what um, what kind, like there's often the debate is, and I think that's also useful to interrupt the debate sometimes there where people say like, what you're suggesting has these and these disadvantages. And then we have to say, okay, but what are you suggesting? You're suggesting to let things run their course, a bit like when someone has a, a fatal disease, then the alternative is not to stay as you are now. The alternative is the cancer will eat up your organ or something. And then the chemotherapy seems the smaller evil. And, and what many people are suggesting that we do to build a better world is not as bad as chemotherapy. It's, it's also, um, yeah, some, some goodbyes are also in there, but not all of them are actually uh, painful because like, like you're losing overweight, it's, it's painful to lose it maybe in the first part of exercise, but then people feel better. So some change happens always and it's not always um, as negative as it feels and what's the alternative to this like is it, and, and as you said like some people feel passionate about something totally else like they feel passionate about or well, they feel very affected by this increasing time pressure and and commercialization of health system and stuff like that but this is interlinked so if you have the conversation then and you realize oh but that's what we want to change and maybe this is the same agenda as what the other person wants to change then um, then they do not oppose to the change anymore, possibly. So we are coming to the end of this lecture, but it is very clear this conversation is not an end, it's a beginning. So to even begin more, I would like to invite everyone to just uh, make a few remarks, what you're taking with you, what you just want to, to share also to the larger audience. Um, Michael, you want to start? Yes, when I find the unmute button. So yes, I just basically want to say thank you for the conversation because the, what I will take with me is a yeah, strong feeling, um, yeah, of of community of that there is happening something and that is actually something, yeah, that we need and 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 yeah should foster and yeah and it's a good feeling to have these kind of conversations and have this. Um, in these kind of settings, because usually that is something you see in movements and not like with within um, organized spaces. So this is something that is really encouraging. So thank you, basically, thank you. Thank you, Maike. Hannah, you wanna go next? Um, yeah, I think one positive vision I certainly um, have now is that we can fight together for climate justice and that we can cooperate to shape systems um, in which individuals can then um, take the right choices because they are made the easy choices and um, that like everything as everything is political we can we can form politics as well thank you marilena um, well i i agree a lot with uh, hannah and maike and one thing that i can add is something very personal because I thought before we started this conversation together, I thought, what can I um, give into this conversation? What like I'm not an expert in 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 healthcare. I'm not a I'm not a doctor or anything like this. I'm just a curious person. I'm just a journalist who writes and um, does a bit research. But now I have the feeling, and that is. is on the one hand due to all of you because you are very um like you worship you are open and you are um friendly so this i think this is due to, to this but also because um it doesn't i i don't feel like i need to be an expert um there are so many experts out there and this is great this is important but it's also important to connect with each other with different backgrounds and 
I think um, <laughs> you all, not with your head, that's very encouraging, thank you. Um, because I know this feeling that sometimes I feel like, oh, I, I'm not sure if, if I have something to say or if, if this is big enough, if this is important enough. And I feel like a lot of people have this feeling sometimes. So uh, I just want to encourage to, to be more self-confident when engaging with others that we can always learn from each other, no matter what background we have and where we, at which point we are in our lives, no matter if we are eight or if we are 80, there's always like a good beginning and it's always worth to begin somewhere. Thank you, Marilena. Sophie? I think I take the image of dancing uh, from Mayara with me. I, I really, really love that. Um, yeah, and the notion of, of public happiness. I think that's something really strong um, and something very positive. And right now we are so much also talking about how our lives will, will go back to normal, but I would want uh, a new normal. And I think public happiness is a good way to describe that new normal that I would love to see. Thank you. Sabina, you want to make a few comments as well? Sure. I, I, I kind of joined late because I had another talk. And then the first thing I heard was the connectedness. And I was like, oh, wonderful. <laughs> and there was an interview of the Süddeutsche Zeitung recently about uh, climate anxiety. And the journalist asked me in the end, like for one word that she should put there. And I was thinking for a while in the end, I ended up with Verbundenheit, which is like the same thing, like connectedness, jointness. And I felt that was maybe the most important one. So it's great to see that we're talking about it and living it at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Leah, you want to also share? Yes, just a quick sentence. Um, it's something from the first Planetary Health Academy I really, really remember. And I don't know what's the word in English, right? But in German, it's Zukunftszuversicht. And I don't know how to probably translate that, but I, it really caught me. And this whole lecture gave me, again, this Zukunftszuversicht. So it's not all going to be bad. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm sure it's going to work out somehow. So uh, I think that would be my thoughts. It's confidence for the future is yeah. a possible translation. And uh, uh, I think it's very important that we create these spaces where these things emerge between us because it's not someone's that is bringing us, it's really happening between us. And uh, this creates a trust that between us also, you know, the things will emerge that are necessary to go this, this, to, to, to be on the critical path, to work through the conflicts, to work with the struggles. And so on and so forth. Um, but we need the connectedness. We can only do this together. Yeah. Felix, you also want to share a word or two? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I would like to. So, uh, yeah, not all of you on the panel have met me before, but I'm also part of the Health for Future uh, network. And in, in the lecture series, I'm uh, in the background, but in other projects, I think I'm, I'm more involved. And today I just felt very, very grateful actually. I mean, seeing all of you guys and, and knowing that I'm a part of what we do and yeah, very grateful uh, for this and and very happy and, and a bit proud as well. So, yeah. Thank you. So Mayara, you came late, last. So now you also have the last word before Hannah then takes over to introduce what is happening in the next lecture. So please, Mayara. Okay, so I was just thinking, I like uh, agree with everyone. Um, I was just thinking that we need uh, courage for what we are proposing here. Mm -hmm. A lot of courage, which needs also passion we need courage to see the past and see what we made wrong. Like Vasco da Gama haven't discovered America. There were already people living here. That's we need courage to change the past history, to give the right acknowledgement to really own this earth and this land. So this earth, no, this land, sorry the English words always. But so we need courage to, to see the past and uh, not just learn from the past, but to change the history that we see on the past. We need courage on the present so we can change the things. 
we need to courage to say that we don't eat meat, that we don't uh, have all the comfort that we have, or recognize the comfort. And uh, like talking from the side that people that have advantage, where, where, where is calming the food that you are eating? Like my patients are starving. I need courage every day to see their faces every single day and to keep thinking about planetary health when we are thinking about hunger and uh, that's what uh, i don't know who said like about uh, having many works or jobs and like that's that's exactly what's going on we have an economic crisis that's knocking our door and it will be very difficult and then we will need courage to say that the way that the thing, the system is working, it's, it isn't working. And uh, I will not agree with a new normal. I don't want the things to stay like they were before. They couldn't. Or otherwise we will keep cutting down Amazon. We will be cutting the trees. I don't want this normal. I don't have a new world, but I don't want anything normal. And I don't want also this pandemic uh, normal, abnormal, or I don't know, but I don't want the normalization. I, we need to be different. We need to be creative, and we need to be together to change. So that's what I I think. And tra transdisciplinarity. I love it that we have a journalist here. We need to communicate, Marilena. We need, and uh, uh, it's urgent. And everybody, if we will need change. We, if we really change, it is not just doctors talking about planetary health or it's everyone, absolutely everyone needs to have to know. So as much as we can have different people, better we will go. So I think this is my final words, Martin. Thank you very much to all. And I'm handing over for Hannah to introduce what is next. Thank you all also who are joining today. Yeah, so um, thanks also from my side and just two announcements um, at the end. If you have um, further comments or visions or perspectives we didn't take into account today or not enough or um, not deep enough, just um, send us an email at info at planetary-health-academy.de. Um, we'd be really happy to, to get uh, further positive visions and are sure that you have more to tell and more perspectives um, that we can all think about and, and learn from. And then next week's lecture um, will be on land use, um, agriculture and nutrition. So make sure you don't miss out on that. And then thanks to everybody and see you next week.